seat back in front of you, you should be able to find a blue card that says welcome on it. If you're a first time guest, we'd love it if you could fill out that card and drop it in the offering plate a little bit later in the service. Now, if you're here for the second time and you already filled out the card last week, all you gotta do is put your first and last name on the back of the card. We're so glad that you're here again and we really appreciate your feedback. We have three different contemporary worship services in the main auditorium on Sunday morning. One at 7.50, 9.15, and 10.45. Our 7.50 service has lower volume and standard house lighting. We also have a traditional worship service in the Barrier Chapel at 10.45. Our hope is that you are able to experience God in a meaningful way. If you miss a service, you can always catch up later by following us on Twitter or liking us on Facebook where we post the services every week. You can also download our Casas app straight from the App Store and watch the services from your phone or your tablet. Hi, my name is Peter Borland. I'm the high school pastor here at Casas Church. One of the things I love about Casas is our desire to introduce others to this relational God. And we have an amazing high school program that does that same thing called SALT. I want to invite you to come check out SALT on Sunday mornings during the 1045 service over in the Choya building. And we also meet every Tuesday for our SALT Tuesday night program from 7 to 9 in the Choya building. We have a blast. We play games. We do a lot of really cool stuff. So I want to invite you to come check it out Sunday mornings at 1045 or Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. Hope to see you there. Well, good morning, Casas. How are you doing this morning? You doing well? Good. It's great to see you all here today if you're a guest with us. Uh, this morning, we're so glad that you came. And I want to mention to you in the, in the seat back in front of you, you'll find a blue card, our welcome card. Uh, if you could take and fill that out a little bit later in the service, you can drop it in the plate. Uh, but it's just our way to, to kind of connect with you a little bit and get you a little bit more information about uh, who we are and ways that you can, can get plugged in here, uh, here at Casas. We're going to jump right in. I'd love it if you could just stand up, turn to the people around you and say hi. I make them feel real welcome.
or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Jesus, we stand in you.
go ahead and be seated. You know, what an amazing thought that for time and all eternity, we worship at the foot of the cross that Jesus intercedes for us now and forever. We have ultimate peace and grace and life with him. And a great reason to sing. You all sound beautiful uh, this morning. Thank you for, thank you for singing. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, invite our ushers uh, forward at this time, and we're going to go ahead and take up our offering. And if you're new with us here today, you know, we, uh, we take up our offering every week. We give our gifts every week as, uh, as an act of worship for who God is and the things that he's doing in our lives. And uh, so uh, I want to just thank you, any of you that, uh, that are a part of this community, uh, that give on a regular basis, that that's a big deal. That, that the way that you faithfully give every single uh, week, um, it really uh, is an amazing thing. And it really is the, the body of Christ coming together and, uh, and actually functioning together to do his work. Uh, so ushers, you can feel free to, to pass the plates at this time. Go ahead and pass the plates. And if uh, you have the blue card with you, if you're new, this is the time to go ahead and take that blue card and throw it right in the plate uh, as it's coming by. Thank you. Uh, well, just a few things to mention here as we're moving on in the service. Um, outside just on the other side of the fountain, we have our signups for Financial Peace University. And if you haven't heard about this yet, uh, this is a ministry uh, and a class uh, that you should sign up for. If you haven't taken it before, um, me and my wife have gone through it. I know that a lot of you have gone through it. And it's a great way to, uh, to learn just how to spend money wisely and how to get out of debt. And uh, so if you haven't signed up for that class, you have this week and next week outside to, to sign up. So make sure to take advantage of that uh, after the service. Go out and sign up for that. Um, also, I want to just kind of take a moment here on behalf of, of our whole church uh, just to recognize uh, everybody that is a part of this church that serves every single week. And you may or may not know this, but, but, uh, but things around here wouldn't happen without, without you, without our volunteers. Anywhere from uh, the people that are greeting you as you're, you're walking in and making this a friendly environment to the ushers right now that are passing the plates to the ABF teachers that prepare a lesson every single week and, and leaders that are volunteer leaders that are leading uh, those groups and caring for each other. And uh, so let's all together, uh, just in the next few moments, uh, put our hands together and thank all of our volunteers here at CASAS. Really, it really is a beautiful thing. Um, I want to mention, last but not least, right after the service, if you're new with us here today, uh, we have a 10-minute party, and it happens right over here in our connection room. You see the sign that's lit up right over there? And what this is is basically just a chance to say hi and, and connect with you. So again, if you're new here today, this is your first or second time, we would love it. It's just right after the service, you come right on back, and uh, we just want to say hi and give you a gift. And, uh, and say hi before you, before you leave on your first time here, all right? So we'll see you right after the service in the connection room.
Sometimes people find themselves confused by this passage in Romans where Paul says, I do what I do not want to do, and what I want to do, I do not do. And the reality is, it's really pretty simple and straightforward when you look at it. I mean, sometimes we do things just to do them, and then we did them, and now they're done, and not because we wanted them, and we're not even sure what we want. I mean, did we really want that? Or did we want to want that, and thereby did that, but we didn't really want it because it's done, and you look at it, and you're dissatisfied in it. So you do things just to do, and sometimes you want things just to want, but you don't really want the things that you want, and sometimes you don't really do the things that you do. You just stand back and there it is and it all kind of happens and suddenly you feel weird about it because you wanted to want something that you did to do but now it's done and you don't know what to do with it. And I think when you look at it that way, it's really pretty simple, isn't it? simple, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I bet you can't relate to that at all, right? Yeah. Um, for instance, like how many times have you ever gone out to dinner and like it, maybe with friends or something or maybe over to their house and it's a really good dinner and like you're partway through dinner and you're like, okay, I'm kind of full. I really don't want to eat anymore but I kind of do. And so you eat some more and then you eat, and as you eat some more and then suddenly you're just like, you know, I'm really not very comfortable right now. I should really stop. And then you eat some more and you're like, what am I doing And this? You know, and then you're just like, I gotta stop. And then they bring out what? Dessert and you're like, oh my gosh, that looks so good. But I don't, I'm starting. Uh, and then you take the dessert and like you eat half of the dessert. And now, now you don't, you really don't feel good. You're like uncomfortable. And then you get like partway through and you're just like, oh man, I shouldn't eat this. And then what do you do? You like eat it, yeah. It's just, and you're like, why do we do that? Um, I was, <clears throat> I say this because like this like actually happened to me here just recently with some friends. And here's what I said to myself, I'll pace myself. Like, what's that do? I'm still getting to the same place, right? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I don't feel good. It just like made me feel miserable and we do that. Um, but like flip that around. What about uh, moments where you feel like, you know what, I'm gonna do the right thing here. And you do do the right thing. You do the thing, uh, you know, you've, um, you're disciplined. You do what you say you're gonna do. You finish the assignments and maybe you apply this to life and you've done all of these things. But why is it that even when you do all the things you said you would do and want to do, that you still look at your life sometimes and go, but you know, this isn't what I wanted. Somehow I'm still struggling with that sense of misery in life, or maybe it's not misery, but it's, it just feels like what I'm really after, I'm not getting in this moment. And I think that's like part of the human condition that we struggle with. We, we do what we don't want to do, but we do what we want to do, but we, and it's just like, what? We, we like confuse ourselves on this stuff with life. And it feels like we're always one step behind on this. And you know, uh, it's part of the human condition. And it's fascinating when you think about Jesus, he had some absolutely brilliant things to say about getting to the life that we really want. Because what so many human beings struggle with today is, no matter what we do, we feel like we never get the life that we really want, see? And what Jesus was so brilliant at doing and laying out is that he understood that the life that we really want, we never attain as like this act of our conscious mind to drum up willpower or to empower our will to go do that thing or go after that thing. That Jesus understood that while willpower can be strong, while we can do things to increase our sense of willpower, in the end, our willpower that simply resides in the conscious mind will always be trumped by something deeper. Jesus understood that what we really need is spiritual transformation. And so when we talk about this notion of the life that we really want, what we're really talking about here is spiritual transformation. And if you look at what Jesus teaches over kind of the totality of the Gospels, uh, how you see New Testament writers reflecting on what Jesus taught, what you come away with is this deep notion that Jesus understood that real life change, getting the life that we really want, is a change that occurs from the inside out. It is fundamentally changing our heart all the way down in the subconscious levels of who we are in our soul. Jesus talks about some very deep things. 
And the beauty of what Jesus says is that you can begin to experience that life. And in so many ways, that's what this series is about. And I hope this morning that wherever you are in those moments where you feel like that life that I want, just it slipped through my fingers. I hope that this morning provides some new insight that encourages you about the life that Christ really does have for you that'll change you. Uh, Jesus said things like this. I want to look at one thing that <clears throat> Jesus said here. And oftentimes we miss the depth of what Jesus is saying. Uh, in Luke 6, Jesus uh, makes this really profound statement that sometimes gets missed. He says, the good man brings good things uh, that, are, that reside in, a, in his heart. And we look at that, and at first it seems like this just little nice thing, but what he's saying there is that there's something that comes from much deeper. In fact, the word that he uses there for resides or stores up is literally the Greek word for treasure. There is something of great value in the human heart. And remember, when Jesus is talking about heart, he's not just talking about you know, the center of our emotions or where we you know, feel really wonderful. When Jesus talks about heart, he is talking about some of our very deep beliefs. And what he's saying is deep down in your soul, down in your heart, there are some things of great value. And the good that comes out, it comes out starting there. And he goes on and he says, um, and the evil man brings evil that resides out of his heart. See, this is about our heart. And so to get at that this morning, I want to I look at kind of what Christ teaches on this, but to get at that, I'm going to use a concept uh, that I first read about uh, by an author and theologian uh, like more than a decade ago, a guy by the name of Michael Novak, a fantastic guy. And I'm going to take his concept. He talks about conviction, and I'm going to take his concept and just use it a little differently than what he uses it to help explain this notion about beliefs that I think Jesus is getting at when he talks about this change in our heart. So let me walk you through these three different types of belief, and you'll see why this becomes so important when we think about uh, spiritual transformation. Uh, the first thing is that we all have a kind of belief that we might call public beliefs. And public beliefs are the things that we espouse publicly because they help us fit in or they help us navigate the human environment uh, that we're in. Um, and it's like we may or may not believe them, but it's more about understanding that our, the culture or the relationships around us are holding on to something here and there's a certain belief we need to have that is good for us, okay? Let me give you just an example of this. Uh, a personal one. If Angie, uh, you know, puts on a new dress and walks up and asks me, and I hate this question. Uh, all men everywhere hate this question, right? Honey, does this dress make me look fat? Well, I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I'm wise enough to know what to say, right? I'm going to say, it makes you look amazing. It doesn't make you look fat at all, right? You know, it's the dumb guy that takes dumb things out of the dumb part of his heart that says, no, only in your hips, honey. Yeah, other than your hips, you look great, right? See? And uh, what that statement is really about, that belief, is primarily, and I'm not saying we're lying or anything on this, okay? But that statement, it's a belief that's more of a public one. It's about navigating a social environment in that moment. Uh, and there's lots of examples this, of this in Scripture. And this morning, I want to use Peter as a kind of biblical example for these different beliefs. You know, there's a moment in the book of Acts where Peter is hanging out with a bunch of Gentiles, and it's this wonderful thing. And then suddenly, there are some Jewish leaders that show up, some Jews that are there. And Peter suddenly... Uh, begins to ignore the Gentiles and goes and hangs out with all of the Jews and he's all like buddy buddy with the Jews and everything and kind of ignoring them and it's like why did he do that because you know Paul later uh, comes along and says you know you could knock that off that, that's a lousy way to treat that's not who you are but why was he doing that well he had these public beliefs that you know what to really make my way in this community, to be an influencer, I've, I've got to be buddy-buddy with these guys. And if I'm too friendly with the Gentiles over there, well, then that could bode bad for me. And so he had this kind of public belief that I need to hang out with this group over here, see? And that would be an example of a public uh, belief. Let me give you another, uh, uh, let's go to the second one. Here, so we have public beliefs, but we also have what I'm going to call private beliefs. And private beliefs are the things that we sincerely believe or desire to be true, okay? But they are tied to other values and circumstances, maybe more than, than we 
think, right? There are some things going on with these beliefs that we're maybe not fully aware of, but we're sincere about them. Let me give you an example of this. How many of you are parents or grandparents? Any parents or grandparents? Okay, a bunch of you, okay. Uh, I'm sure this has never happened to you, but it's, it has uh, happened on occasion in our house. Uh, especially when our kids are younger, they would, they would see some toy or something and they would say, you know, dad, dad, if you would just get me this toy, I will never ask you ever again for anything in the world. I need this toy so much that I'll never ask ever again. Now, anyone ever have that happen? You know? Yeah, yeah. Now, in that moment, were they sincere? Did they really think if I just get that toy, this will satisfy my heart for, you know, for the rest of my life if I just get... Well, yeah, they were sincere in that moment. Uh, maybe you have teenagers, and this is where it navig- uh, you know, uh, uh, progresses to. Uh, then it became, oh, Dad, if I could just get an iPhone 4. Five, an iPhone 5. I'll never ask you for another phone, nothing ever again, ever, right? And they think that, you know, and there's sincerity about it, but here's the truth, right? Circumstances change. Yeah, then there's like an iPhone 5S, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, <gasps> you know? And what they once thought that would satisfy all their needs, suddenly doesn't so much anymore. Suddenly the circumstances change. Suddenly there's another value maybe in a different circumstance. And suddenly what you held in tight belief is actually a little more fickle than we realized, see? Uh, Back to Peter, biblical example on this. Remember, Peter's up in the upper room, and this is last days of Christ, and he's sharing with all of the disciples, this is, here's what's getting ready to go down, and he says to them in this room, he says, now, you know, I'm going to be arrested, this is going to go bad, one of you is actually going to um, betray me, and what, and there's Peter, and you know, I love Peter, no unspoken thought out of Peter. Everything comes into his head, but he's got to say it, you know? And in that moment, you can just picture this moment, but not me, not me, I wouldn't do that, you know? And he's just on, and he's on this little rampage of, I would never do that. And what's uh, interesting there is then Jesus responds uh, uh, in this moment, and he actually, he says uh, to Peter, let me find the, the passage, he, uh, he says to, to Peter, um, you know, actually, Peter, you're going to actually deny me like three times, he says. And of course, Peter in this moment, he's taken back by this. And I want you to hear what he says in this moment. This is over in uh, Mark chapter 14, verse 31. But Peter insisted emphatically, and here's what he says, I mean, with great emotion, emotion and passion, here's what he says. Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. Even if I have to die, I would never, ever disown you. Now, a question for you. Was Peter sincere in that moment? Yeah, I think he was. Do you think he believed it in that moment? I think he did. But then circumstances changed a little while longer, didn't they? And what Peter so emphatically believed at one point uh, here ends up not being quite as true or as deep a belief as he thought. That's the nature of private beliefs. They're sincere, we believe them, but they're a little fickle. They're more dependent on circumstances and other values than we always realize, okay? Which leads to a third kind of belief, and I'm gonna call this core scripts. Um, And so when you think of a core script, these are the things that we believe that, that operate like a script we follow, often without being aware of it. We will follow these beliefs because, see, they're rooted down deep in our subconscious, down in our heart. And we follow these beliefs uh, even when we're not aware of them. They're that deep and that strong. And the reason I call them a script is because it's like, it's like a script to a movie or a book that we would follow. Let me give you... Uh, an example of this one. And this is probably, this is a really simple example, but this would be one we all share. We probably all share a core script in gravity, right? We all kind of believe in gravity. You're probably not going to walk out of here today and walk through those doors with this deep-seated fear that you're going to walk out the doors and suddenly 
uh, you know, the centrifugal uh, force of the earth is going to fling you up into outer space, right? You just believe in gravity. You believe in gravity. It's going to hold you on the ground. And you live congruent uh, or congruent with the, your beliefs with gravity, even when you're not thinking about it. You don't struggle with temptations to jump off of tall things, thinking that you'll float. Well, you know, I saw something fall yesterday, but maybe if I jump off, I won't. I'll float, right? How many of you have ever struggled with this deep temptation to jump off of tall things, thinking you would float? Probably not. Well, okay, put it down here. Okay, so most of us in the room share this core script. Not all of us. You might want to work on this just a little bit, because it'll get you in trouble uh, later in life. Uh, maybe even this afternoon, okay? So just, yeah, uh, right? Uh, that would be a simple one. Um, or uh, what about this? Think about this one as one that uh, might trump uh, a private belief. How many of you have ever been in a place where you're just like, man, I just got back from the doctor and my cholesterol's kind of high and my doctor knows I'm not working out and knows I'm not eating right. It's time to, you know, more vegetables, less calories. I got to exercise a little. And so you say to yourself, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get healthy. I want to live a long life. I want to be good. And so I'm going to watch what I eat. I'm going to exercise. I'm going to get enough sleep, all those things. And so then you're doing really good with this, doing all the right things. And then you have this really stressful day at work. And it turns into two stressful days at work that turn into a stressful week. And you're just like, oh my gosh. And then a funny thing happens late Friday night. It's like this deep voice down in your heart says, we don't care about the healthy diet anymore. We're stressed out down here. And we think what we need most is comfort, as in comfort food. And somewhere down deep in your soul, you have a core script that says, comfort trumps a good diet, right? And the next thing you know, it's like 10 o'clock at night and you're sitting in front of the TV and you didn't even bother to go get a bowl to eat the ice cream out of. You have a spoon and you're scooping it right out of the carton. And it is not even the ice cream you like because you finished that carton off an hour ago, right? This is like your kid's tutti fruity bubble gum ice cream that, you know, but but it feels good. And there's like some core script in you that says, we needed this, don't stop, okay? And just, and see, and you're just like, where did that come from? I was so committed to this, why? Well, it's because we all have these core scripts deep down inside of us, right? And they have power and they're operating even if we're not aware of them. Think of Peter for a moment. Peter, in this moment, with his closest friend in all of the world, and he swears to him, I will stand by your side no matter what, leaves the room. Circumstances change a little bit. It's not even a Roman soldier. It's not even a big guy. It's just a girl, okay, comes up to him and says, don't you know Jesus? And, you know, not me, not me. And, just, and he gets kind of snippy. And, just, and in that moment, he throws his best friend and savior under the bus. Why? Well, you know, I've thought about this a lot. I think in that moment, Peter hated what he did. I think in that moment, Peter knew it was wrong. I think in that moment, he was dying on the inside because he loved Jesus with all of his heart. I think it was a terrible moment for him. But in that moment, he did what the deepest part of his heart said made sense. There was a part of him that said at the end of the day, I'm not actually secure in Christ as much as I thought I was and I had better act on my own behalf in this moment. And the most sensible way to do that is to deny him. That is what will keep me safe and secure. And it was a core script that just trumped all other things in that moment, see? And the reality is, uh, we all have core scripts. We have core scripts that are down deep in our heart. And the reality is we have core scripts 
of all different types that are in there. And sometimes those core scripts are in conflict. Sometimes we have good core scripts that are very much aligned with who God has created us to be. But we have core scripts that are in conflict with that as well. We have core scripts uh, that go all over the place. Uh, Core scripts uh, that say, um, there's a part of me that is broken and therefore it can't be fixed. And you walk through this world feeling like I can't be fixed and it's sabotaging so many things that you do. Some of us have core scripts uh, that say because of something I did or something somebody did to me, I am really not a lovable person and therefore uh, you end up sabotaging every deep loving relationship you have. Or maybe some of you have core scripts that just say you got to be perfect. You got to be perfect in everything you do and it drives you in school it drives you at work it drives you in your relationships and any moment you sense that you're not perfect becomes a bad moment in your life where you feel like your worth even before God falls and half most of the time we're unaware of the power of those core scripts going in on our lives and they're all down there in our heart. And the question is, how did that happen? Because when I talk about it, right, we all go, you know, I know that's true. I've experienced that in my own life. That's why Paul says, I do what I do not want to do, and I do what I don't want to do. Why do I do that? You understand, every human being was created to have their identity in God. But we know going all the way back to Genesis 2 and especially in Genesis 3 that there was a great loss. There was a kind of separation between us and God at some deep spiritual level. And we know that that great loss, that separation was a disconnect from the, from the source that we were created to have that would give us our truest identity. And so we don't have that. And the reality is every single human being must have an identity. We can't function without a sense of identity. And so what happens in a broken world? We begin finding that identity in all of these different places. We find it from moments and experiences in our childhood. We find it in relationships with friends. We find it through experiences at school or work or things that happened to us or things that we did. And sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. But it becomes this plethora of all of these different sources of identity that begin building this set of core scripts deep down inside of us. And they're all messed up and they're in conflict. And the truth is, it has left us in this place where we are fractured in our souls. We are divided. We are not whole. See, that is depravity. When scripture talks about we suffer from this thing called depravity, depravity is simply being creatures that have divided souls because we don't have the adequate connection to our God that begins to change that, see? So when Jesus is teaching about changing things, where is he going with this, see? It's interesting, when Jesus ministered here on this world, we get to see his heart on this issue and so many things. There's, uh, I want to read a passage to you um, found over in, let me find it, uh, found over in uh, Matthew. Turn around, let me find it here. Um, maybe not. I don't know where I am right now. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to quote it to you. How about that? Um, there's this moment where Jesus is, uh, uh, te- it is in Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, um, where he is, it says he comes into to these villages and he begins teaching and preaching and helping them understand what the gospel is all about. And then there comes this uh, moment in Matthew chapter 9 uh, when Jesus sees the crowd. It says he sees the crowd and he had compassion on them because they were harassed. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Well, of course they were. 
Of course they were in that moment because I think Jesus looked at those people and he understands they've got this jumbled up mess of core scripts. They've got core scripts that are ripping them apart. They're not whole people. And I think Jesus looks at that and he says, that is the thing that breaks my heart. That is the thing that I see that I want to change in this world. And friends, I think sometimes he looks at you and he looks at me and he has compassion on us. In those moments that your core scripts are taking you someplace you do not want to go, where they break your heart or rip you apart, you have a God that is looking on your life with great compassion. I think about a kid that maybe grows up in a family where one of his parents uh, suffers from some things that causes that parent to want to bend and contort all relationships around feeding the emptiness inside of him or her, and they become manipulative, and they want everyone to be able to lift them up so that they can have their own sense of value, but it comes at the price of everyone around them, and especially their kids, and that kid grows up learning that the only way to survive is to be a little bit manipulative and to hold back and to not be vulnerable anywhere that you don't have to be because vulnerability always spells disaster and pain. And maybe that was you. And you have this core script about never being vulnerable and being manipulative if you have to to protect yourself. And you know what? I want to say this. It served you well to survive that family. But it's not serving you now, is it? That core script is robbing you of the life that God has for you. And somewhere as a little kid, you were searching for an identity, and that core script became an answer in that moment. But now it is keeping you from the marriage you want. It is keeping you from the friends that you want. Because every moment you step towards vulnerability in a relationship that you want and long and desire for, there's a core script that sabotages it. Or maybe there's a part of you that is this wonderful value about being a, a peaceful person, someone who promotes peace or grace or kindness, and it is a good thing, a truly good thing, but there's also kind of a dark side to it. There's another core script that is in conflict with it, and it carries this notion that you must be a peacekeeper at all cost that if there is not peace around you, that life is not okay. And suddenly, you find yourself in the family where you're the peacekeeper in the family. You're the one in the family, right, where when all the family comes over, you've got to arrange the chairs, right, you know, because there's Uncle Joe and Uncle Bob, and if they sit next to each other, it turns into a political conversation, and then, you know, and so I'm going to put Joe over here and Bob over here, and you manage all of that stuff, and you're taking care, and it kind of becomes your role, and then when different family members get into little snippets, it's in fights and you're the one that they always call instead of calling the one they're upset at why are they calling you because they're lobbying you they want you on their side because they know you're the one that navigates all this stuff and part of you is angry about that and you just say you know why don't you call your own sister and handle that but if you're really honest right there's a part of you that would feel really insecure if they didn't call because you being in that position has somehow come to a place that gives you a sense of identity, even if you don't like it. And it's just a core script about being a peacekeeper at all costs. And we all struggle with this. So let me ask you another question. When Scripture talks about you and I being changed in glorious ways. When Paul in 2 Corinthians says, in Christ, you are a new creation, what exactly is becoming new? When Jesus talks about changing you and me, what is he wanting to change? Is he wanting to change our public beliefs, our private beliefs, or do you think he's wanting to change our core scripts? See, I think when Jesus says, I want to talk to you about the heart. I think the reason Jesus was always so frustrated with the Pharisees is because they put everything about spiritual life into the will and the conscious mind, and it's just, okay, you just do these things, these things, these things. And they miss this idea that we're more complex creatures. God created us with a heart, with this depth, and what Jesus wants to do is to come in and to change that at the deepest levels. In fact, if you really want to understand what Jesus is doing in his teaching, 
You have to understand this. Rarely ever is Jesus teaching how to do things. Rarely is Jesus giving commands or new rules. He just doesn't hardly ever do it. You know what Jesus does in the vast majority of all of his teaching? He is teaching us the truth about the way things really are and exist. And if you can begin to see the teachings of Jesus is giving you the most brilliant insight, insight into the truth about this world and your own soul, I promise you it will set you free to live toward a new kind of life you've never experienced. It will cause you to read the words of Jesus with a depth that you never saw before. See, so when we talk about spiritual transformation around here, I want us to not think of spiritual transformation as just, you know, some pathway for becoming good. Spiritual transformation is a journey with God to become whole in our hearts. That is what spiritual transformation is about. Have you ever thought about this? I'm on a little side tangent. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus goes through this entire life. He faces all the temptations we face. He faces things far more difficult than most of us have faced in this room. And yet he never sinned once. There was never a moment that he gave into a temptation. And I think oftentimes we think, you know, man, he just had the most amazing willpower ever. Jesus just, he fought through those temptations and he struggled and he overcame. You know, I wonder this. I wonder if Jesus actually didn't struggle that much with most of the temptations he faced. You know why? Because they didn't make sense to him. I struggle with temptation. There are moments that I give in to temptations. I do stupid things. I do sinful things, and they're hard for me. But you know what? It's because I think I've got some core scripts that keep telling me that's what I need. And it's because I'm, I've got this condition of depravity. Depravity is nothing more than just existing in the condition where I've got these jumbled up core scripts inside of me because I'm not adequately connected to God to have that central identity purely in him. And so, man, there are temptations that seem like a good answer to me. But what if for Jesus, he looked at those temptations and he said, you know, that just, that doesn't make sense to me. It may be hard, it may be painful, but what makes sense to me is to simply follow God, my Father, in this way. And so when scripture talks about becoming like Christ, what if that's what he's inviting you into? What it, you, know, if, you know, when Scripture talks about becoming like Christ, I just have this sense that it's not like we're supposed to share the same favorite color with Jesus. We're not supposed to, like, share the favorite food that Jesus had. It's just, you know, I think what Scripture's talking about in those moments is that we can become like Christ and that we can, He will transform us into having whole hearts the way Jesus had a whole heart. I think about that, I want that life. That's the life I want. So let me just take the minutes I have left here, and I want to talk to you just, I want to make some application here about maybe taking some first steps in that kind of life, okay? Uh, The first one is this. Be mindful. Be mindful uh, in, in grace. And what I mean by that is be mindful of the fact that you're going to have a lot of core scripts. You're going to have core scripts that are so aligned with who God made you to be. Core scripts that will take you in the right direction and serve you well. But you will also have core scripts that no matter how loud they scream or yell or push on you are not who God made you to be. Keep that in mind. And you know what? Give yourself grace. When you, those moments you give into those core scripts, they're powerful, they're strong. It takes some rewriting to get past them. Give yourself grace. Second thing, second thing is this, pay attention. Uh, the great power that core scripts have is that we're unaware of them. They're operating 24-7 right out of our unconscious mind. 
And if you can begin to pay attention and begin to see what those core scripts are in your life, suddenly you will begin to have a lot more power. Um, we'll look at this verse some uh, more later, but there's this great passage where Jesus, and again, this goes back to how Jesus taught, right? Jesus is talking to this group of Jewish followers of his, and he's trying to get them to understand how to give up this religious life that they were once in, and there's this other thing, and he says this, listen, if you understand my teachings, right, and his teachings are all about understanding the truth about the way things are, he says, if you can understand my truth, or my teachings, you will know the truth. Think about this. And the truth will what? Set you free. If you can take what is unconscious and deep down in your heart that is some dark core script and suddenly you can begin to see it, you will begin to have power over it in ways you never had before. Even when you fall to it, you can say, ah, oh, I know what's going on. Pay attention to things like, is there some sin in your life? And you just say, oh my gosh, I hate it when I do this and I keep doing this and I keep doing this and I keep doing this. Well, you know what? Maybe it's not time to say, okay, I'm just gonna try harder not to give into that temptation. Maybe it's time you say, maybe there's something deeper that I'm not aware of that keeps driving me toward that. And maybe if you begin to pay attention, you might begin to see where some core script about loneliness or pain or self-protection or the need to be perfect in all things is driving you to actually sabotage your own life. Another thing to pay attention to is places of pain or struggle or moments of depression or great anxiety. Where is that coming from, right? And sometimes that can give, give you great insight into maybe what's coming out of your heart and pushing uh, on your mind and your will. Pay attention. Ask God for wisdom about where some of those core scripts are and, and what they're doing to you. Uh, third thing, last thing here, and this comes as a challenge because as you pay attention, you're gonna begin to see some of these core scripts in your life. And here it is. You have to risk growth over security. And here's why I say this. Your core scripts, many, many, many of them, are about trying to keep you secure. And a lot of those core scripts come from when we were very, very young. And they were there to maybe make you feel secure. That being perfect makes you feel valuable and you feel secure when you feel valuable. Or maybe uh, avoiding all vulnerability at all cost uh, makes you feel secure. But here's the deal. Whenever we pick security, that is, the, that is the small life. When we pick those moments to not venture out, when we pick those moments to give in to manipulation or to give in to cheap things that, that cause us to give us that, that moment that we'll feel okay, in the end, that is always a small life and it is not the life you were created to have. And I wish it wasn't this way, but it is what I have experienced in my own soul. Growth only comes through risk. Growth comes when you know that you're that peacekeeper. You know you have been letting someone at school or work walk all over you. And you know this is no longer an issue of just being graceful or kind to this person. You can be kind and have a confrontational conversa conversation to say, you know what, I'm going to have to tell you, this is enough. I'm, I'm not going to allow you to do this anymore. And there's a part of you that is terrified. If I confront this person, if I confront a coworker, what if they go around my back? What if they undermine me? What if I say something to my boss that would, I, and it's this fear and this terror, but I promise you, if you keep giving into that, you will, you, it's a small life. You won't have what you were created to have. And the risk comes when you say, this is the life that God is calling me to be. I can be kind, but I can also be truthful. And I'm going to have that conversation and it will feel risky. But friends, that is what growth is about, and that is the larger life. That is when you begin to feel the energy of who you were created to be. And let me close with this thought. This is your life. This is your life. This is your gift from God. And yes, you're depraved. So am I. Get over it, okay? And what it means is now, 
I am being invited and you're being invited into this journey of spiritual transformation where we can begin to understand those core scripts and what they're doing. And it will be in God's power that you get invited to step into the risk of that larger life. And the more you experience that larger life, the more you will love who God has made you to be. So, and not that I'm passionate about this for our church, okay? But this is your life, risk growth over security. Let's pray. Stand for a prayer. Okay. I'm excited for where your life is going to go, okay? I am. I am. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for the most incredible lessons that your son Jesus Christ taught on this earth in the beauty of his compassion and grace on us. I just thank you, God, that you are so willing to journey with us that we might actually begin to experience the larger life of who you have created us to be. And we pray that we as a church would be a body of believers that just lifts us up and shines with your truth. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Y'all have a great morning. We've got the 10-minute party starting here in the next few moments. And so if you're new, we would love to see you back there.